Welcome to Living the Next Chapter. This is Dave. Happy to have you back. Today I have a guest, my first guest, I think, ever in from South Africa in Johannesburg. Um, my guest is Mart Marie Breedit. And Mart Marie is a survivor, a conqueror. She lost 80 kilograms, which is 176 pounds. And she comes to share her journey of weight loss. But not just a physical weight loss, but the emotional weight loss as well. And she shares her heart openly with us, an amazing guest. And I'm so happy to have Mart Marie here on Living the Next Chapter. Here's a little bit, a little clip from the episode, just to pique your interest. Here we go. I've heard a lot, I've heard a lot back from my readers, which is, as you say, I'm... Um, for me, being a first-time author, oh, when I, I remember when I hit that publish button on Amazon, I was like, oh, what did I do? <laughs> I think, I, I was like, I had, um, what do you call it? Um, vulnerability hangover. <laughs> it's like, you know, what, what, <laughs> what did I, you know, because this book is intensely personal. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's like a piece of me that I've put out there. And now it's open to everybody to judge almost. But the support has been amazing. When I got those first few store reviews on Amazon, oh my goodness, that means a lot. By the way, if you're a reader of books, do review. It means so much. <laughs> It means a lot to the means a lot to the authors to see those the star ratings and the reviews. Um, so it's a in order to lose weight and maintain it, you have to truly believe that you are worth it. Eating well and exercising are both acts of self love. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's when I hear messages from people that that talk about the honesty of the book. And the, the way that I've not left everything out, how I just, you know, I try to tell even the things that I know people don't want to hear. Um, so I, I, I try to not sugarcoat anything. And yeah, so people comment on that. And that just warms my heart so much. It makes me feel like this was worth it. It was worth publishing this book. And putting myself out there. Welcome everyone to Living the Next Chapter. I have a guest with me from a land far away from me. And I think the first time ever that I've had a guest from this beautiful country and this beautiful city, Johannesburg. Mart Marie's with me and Mart Marie's a author and she has an amazing story to share with us to encourage us all. And I'm so well happy to have you on the podcast. Hello and welcome from Canada. Nice to see you. How are you? Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Um, yeah, I, I'm well. Thank you. Um, yeah. It's exciting. Now, you mentioned before we hit record that this is your first time being on a podcast. And I am so happy to share you and your story with our audience. And we actually have listeners in your part of the world. So I don't know if, would you like to sit, give a greeting, say hello to the people who will be listening in your part of the world? Would that be okay? Yes, absolutely. Um, it is almost unreal to think that people in my part of the world will also be listening to this. Um, yeah, so yeah, if you are from South Africa and you are listening, thank you. Thank you for tuning in and for, for listening. Um, yeah, and and also to the other listeners across the world. I think my message has been spread in South Africa quite a lot, and by some of my friends in the UK as well. But yeah, what a what an what an honor and a privilege to have this platform. It's amazing, and we can talk to people. You and I are talking right now, which is I find yeah. amazing. A person in Canada and you in Johannesburg together talking about your book and about you and your story, the world is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And it's so nice that you and I can have this conversation and people can listen to this like right away. And then also like years from now, this is just going to live out there as 
content that's going to be available to encourage people. Now, your story is amazing and unique. Can you tell us a little bit about your background as it relates to your book? And then we'll kind of get into the story a little deeper. But can you kind of take us back to maybe the origin of why you wrote this book and a little bit about your backstory? Absolutely. Um, actually, talking about this, um, you know, this, this podcast staying on for a long time, I just thought, you know, this is the wonder of writing a book as well. Because a book becomes like a little bit of a legacy that you get to leave behind. Um, that's one of the wonderful things about writing and also about being a reader because I love to read as well. So, yeah, so where my story started, um, I, what, in the beginning of 2017, I, I, well, well, at the f- February 2017, I got on the scale and I weighed 165 kilograms, which, um, oh, which which was a huge shock to me, and I needed to lose weight in order to have a hernia operation. So I started this weight loss journey with eighty kilograms of weight that I needed to lose. Now, I'm aware that the metric system and things might confuse people, but eighty kilograms lose is a lot of weight. I think I write it here on the back: hundred and hundred and seventy six pounds. Of weight. Um, wow. So yeah, so I went, I went on this weight loss journey, and I, I reached my goal weight at in December 2019. And one of the one of the first things that I thought that day that I reached my goal was, you know, what now? Because um, how do I? Someone that's been overweight her entire life. I've been overweight since I was four years old. Basically, I've obese my entire, entire life. And how do I figure out how to maintain this, this weight loss? Um, yeah. So in the beginning of, and at the beginning of my goal weight journey, let's call it a goal weight journey. I, um, you know, I thought I'll, I'll, you know, I'm just going to stay, keep on dieting. You know, I'm just going to stay strict to my program and I'm going to, um, you know, at that stage, I always had free crutches at that stage. I had my, um, the thing that I weighed myself every single day to check. I had my running. I started running at the end of 2018. I had my running and then I had my group talks. So I, because I was part of a, of a weight loss um, group program, you know, checking in at a group every week and weighing there. I, when I started struggling towards the end of 2019, um, with, you know, with finishing this weight loss journey, I asked our group leader if I can do our group talks. So I had that group talks that kept me going back to our group and keeping me motivated until I actually reached my goal weight. Now, when 2020 started and when lockdown started, suddenly two of those scratch, scratches got pulled out from under me because I couldn't run anymore. I ran outside in the street. So I, and that became illegal. In South Africa, we weren't allowed to exercise outside. And then I couldn't do, of course, do not do my group talks. So, I was like, the only thing that remained was weighing myself every single day. And that, you know, that wasn't a very feasible, um, thing to do. So, so I started, you know, grabbing at straws to, um, to see how I can maintain this weight loss. Um, and I started uh, running in my garden. I ran around a tree in the front of my yard. Which was only about 40 meters long, but I ran about 10 kilometers around in my yard every day and I started doing online videos, which, yeah, and that, that sort of was my way of trying to cope with not picking up weight again. I, yeah, and then somewhere, um, just a few my, a few weeks into, into lockdown, I crossed paths with a therapist and he, um, he insisted 
that I, you know, he, he never saw me. We, I mean, we hardly we ever went out during lockdown. He, he, he never saw me physically, but from our interactions, he picked up that something was not right. And he insisted that I come for some therapy with him. Just to, and I was so, I was so against therapy at that stage. I was like, no, you know, therapy is not, um, it's not for me. I'm not, there's nothing wrong with me. I don't, I don't need to come for therapy. And he was like, but we can try. We can try and sort out this. Why, why are you so obsessed about your weight? And, you know, and there was other things I was also um, concerned about that I thought, okay, I'll give it a try. And it, that became the start of a wonderful journey into understanding why I've been struggling with my weight my entire life and what's cause, what, what causes me to, you know, the only way I can see myself maintaining weight is being obsessed about what I eat and what the number on the scale says and why do I have that obsession and how can I free myself? How can I just live? Cause that was my, you know, at, at one stage, um, you know, I would, I would get on the scale and I would, um, you know, weigh myself and I would think there's got to be more to life than this. Um, you know, just being pedantic about what I eat and what I, um, how much I weigh and there's got to be more to life than this. And he helped me discover that. And there, there was one stage, there was a, a moment of realization that I did about emotional eating. And that became such such an eye opener for me that I that I decided that I want to do a video about this. Now just when lockdown started I did three or four, four, four live videos on my um on my personal profile just to replace those group talks. That were, that, that was one of my crutches or that were one of my crutches. So now I'm an Afrikaans person. So sometimes my English mm -hmm. just runs out. <laughs> just, <laughs> but yeah, so I, so I, um, so I, I, um, I did some videos from my personal profile, but the emotional eating message and the message that pressed on my heart at that stage, um, much later, many months later, um, was such a strong message that I decided I'm going to start this group and I'm going to share this video about emotional eating and we'll see where that goes from there. And my idea was just to do that one video. And yeah, and somebody saw, I also posted some bits and pieces of writing and some, you no, know, more or less asking questions, but how do, how do thin people stay thin? And, um, yeah, and I, so I posted some of my writing and things on there and I did this video of on emotional eating and a f well a stranger at that stage approached me and she suggested that um I should consider writing a book that was in December 20, December 2020 I should consider mm. writing a book and yeah I I um thought she was crazy <laughs> <laughs> And, but the idea played on my, in my mind so much to write this book. And I decided that I am going to just write my story. It's almost like a testimony, I think. Mm. Um, just write down my story about all the roots of where my emotional eating comes from and the entire process I had to work through in order to heal, heal from those wounds. And, to get to a point in my life where I can just live. And yeah, and that's how 80 Kilos of Shame came to be, which was released it. at the end of 2021. Yeah. 2021. So, so when you were writing this book, were you writing it just to simply capture your story personally, or were you writing it thinking, I'm going to write this book for someone? Or was it a kind of a combination of both? 
I think it was a bit of a combination of both. Okay. I wrote when when I made a decision that I want want to write it. The first thing I decided that if I'm going to write this, I'm not going to leave anything out. I'm going to okay. write it as honest and as pure and as no, no nothing nothing spared as I possibly can. And I wrote it for myself in order to give words to what I was feeling and what I've been going through. And it's a, it's a writing is an is an amazing healing activity. It's mm-hmm. you no, know, it's it's like therapy in itself. Um, yeah. And I wrote it to open the eyes of others to how they view food. Because people tend to think of dieting as a punishment almost. That, you no, know, they've got to suffer through periods of dieting and then it's, then they can go back to eating normally. They don't see food as, you no, know, food is a nourishment for my body and food is, you know, it's got a, it's got a purpose. I'm eating because I, need something from the food and the food is there to help me and they you know especially when you get to emotional eating food becomes a comfort and uh celebrate you know like a i'm gonna celebrate the good times i'm celebrating well i'm grieving the Mm -hmm. bad times everything with food instead of thinking of what food is actually just a nourishment for my body and yeah so the the goal, goal is to get to think differently about food and what they eat and why they eat. Yeah, and, and there's it's also a social element. Food is wrapped in our social activities when we get together, right? And there's yes. there's parties and anniversaries and birthday cakes and so like any kind of event, there's usually some sort of meal component or you know, sharing food with each other and I would think that if somebody is is focused on on their health and a diet that that could maybe play in a little to your social aspects take take the pandemic out of the situation but just in a social setting food is plentiful and if it's something that you're working through I'm just wondering from your perspective how does what do you see your correlation between food and social you see a, a link there? There's definitely a link there. Um, I wrote a chapter in the book on the messages that we are, especially for two children, the messages we are giving our children to food in the way that we, we bring them up. Because, you know, oftentimes food is given as a reward. You know, if you got good marks at school, then you, you go for ice cream or, um, you know, even even school. I I don't know how, how what it's like in Canada, but even the school principal here will say, no, if you're um if you no know, take the children out for something because of the good exam results, and so that's one. Food is often a reward. You know, if you um if you are celebrating a birthday or you know something else, the tables are stacked. With treats and, you know, these people and his family and love and laughter and so, yeah, so there's, it's, we definitely do. And then the messages that, you know, that we, we've got weird messages that we give about food. But what I've, what I've come to realize, what, well, in order to deal with a social situation is that the time that I get to spend with the people that I love and the people, um, you know, that, that come to celebrate with me, that is the key. That is the focus. Not what I'm putting in my mouth while I'm spending this time with people. Mm-hmm. So I've tried working, shifting my, to cope with social situations. I'm not there because of the food. And the, the food is something that's nice and you know, everything. But for me, I've shifted my focus to the time that I get to spend with 
the people there. That is my reward mm. now. It's not that I get to eat nice food. Yeah. That makes sense. So to take me back, like you mentioned, you you were you were set up to to go have surgery, and that was kind of the the spark to begin losing weight. Please. Take me back to those days. How how were you feeling personally about yourself? How were you feeling about? We talk about self image. We talk about what we think of ourselves, how we see ourselves. When you look back in those earlier days, what? How do you see yourself now compared to them? Self self love, I think, is the theme that you're almost touching here at the moment. The okay. So maybe let's start with mm-hmm. the surgery that I needed. Because I I suffered from abdominal hernias, quite a few of them. I had, I've got a weak gastric membrane. Um, so I needed the surgery. And the surgeon, well, my doctor wouldn't even refer me to, to a surgeon until I lost the weight. It was just because of the... The risks involved in being overweight and having the specific, the specific abdominal surgery. So, so I had to lose the weight in order just to be referred. And then the surgeon asked me to lose a few more kilograms before I could finally have the surgery. So that was in 2018, April 2018. I had my surgery. So it was just more than a year after I started my weight loss journey. And then there came the, I won't say frets, but the thing that if I'm going to gain weight again, then I'm going to put my body at risk. And I think all that combined sort of pulled me through to finally reach my goal weight in 28, uh, at the end of 2019. So, but self-love is, you know, obviously I'm happy that I had the surgery because that was a huge discomfort. And that, you know, I, I used to spend hours lying on the bed trying to push Mm-hmm. Um, intestines back that were trapped in the hernia. So, so obviously that's a huge medical relief for me. But self love is about more than just that. I mean, if we, if we are born, we small children, they automatically love themselves. You know, they um, you can see it by the way they look at themselves in the mirror. And they laugh and when they, when they walk and they talk, they dance. I mean, children don't care what others think of them. They, they just think they're amazing. And, you know, small, um, yeah, children, <laughs> children will say whatever they want. <laughs> they don't care what others think of them. They, yeah, they just think they're super. And slowly but surely over time, um, the world chips back at that self-love. You know, you will not be invited to a party or nobody wants to play with you or your parents shout at you um, or your boyfriend dumps you. <laughs> you or you go for job interview after job interview and you just don't make it. And, mm-hmm. you know, after a while, you just... So, but yes, see, am I, am I worthless? You know, is anyone going to love me? Is it, you know, people will make fun of my appearance. No, and in some way, you've got to cope mm-hmm. with all that disappointment. And some people, they, you know, they've got a loving support structure. That can help them that, that like, uh, for, for, for example, for my own children, I will try to have them catch me out saying something nice about them to someone else. I will go, my, my, my youngest, I'm a mama four. My youngest, when, when I'll, I'll, I'll talk to her dad, to my husband, and I'll tell her, you know, Audrey's got mm. such a lovely smile. And then I'll make sure that she's within hearing distance. And, you know, just so that it, I can, Try and somehow build up a little bit of that self confidence back. Mm. You no, know, so some people have got have a support structure that can help them. Other people, 
um, yes. they become depressed maybe, fall into some form of depression or, or something. Or um, you'll get people that start want to numb the feelings with alcohol or nicotine or food. Okay? And so people have different ways of coping with the onslaughts of the world yeah. and that lack of self-love. Yeah, that's... And I think for my life, because I come from, um, you know, I... Besides for my weight, I had, you know, I I had quite a... How can I say? A difficult childhood, <laughs> which I talk about in my book. And... And I had a lot of healing that I needed to do and reasons why I ate. Mm. You know, reasons that was just food. Food made me feel loved. I loved food. It was like a wonderful relationship. And, you know, in the beginning, you know, I will I could eat a little bit and I'd feel, mm. okay, you know, it's like a little bit of chocolate and I'll feel, yay, I feel a little bit better. And then after a while, that's just not, enough anymore then you need the whole slab or you need two slabs or um and that's how you become addicted i i I, I, I say i'm probably still addicted to food i'll always be a recovering a recovering food addict um or recovering emotional eater if you think but i i'm trying my best Mm -hmm. to control that (laughs) and to to work with that and to live with that Mm-hmm. So who, like you, you talked about your, your group that you would meet with before the pandemic, who in your life also helped you to stay on track, be accountable? Who was your support? Like, did you have some people in your corner that were encouraging you through the whole journey? And how, what did they mean to you in that? My husband is an amazing pillar of support. I always say, whenever I write a bio um, about myself, my first sentence is always, I'm a happily married mom of four. That's usually in my first sentence. And, um, yeah, my husband's been nice. an amazing pillar of support. Next year, we'll be married for 20 years, um, 25 years together. And... Yeah, when I, um, wow. when I started, when I started on my weight loss journey again, my, my husband was, oh, he was quite cynical in the beginning because I, I, I decided I'm not going to exercise initially. I mean, I was 80 kilograms overweight. So I didn't, yeah, I didn't think I'm going to get the exercising thing right. So. So he was a bit cynical of that, but with regards to the food, he was very supportive. I mean, they, my children probably hate me, but they have got to eat what I eat. My husband ate what I ate. He, he also lost, mm-hmm. what, about 40 kilograms, 30, 35. I wrote it down at some stage. He also lost a lot of weight at the same stage. At when I started running, he started running with me. He He's now decided he's going to rather do cycling, but... <laughs> But in that first few days, he did, he did run with me. That's, well, the first few months, he ran with me. Yeah, and my children, I mean, as much as they moan and complain about everything, they are actually amazing. Um, they, you know, it was never a case of, um, you know, oh, mom's on a diet, you know, you, you're going to moan about it and, and everything. It was more like guys, Mom is on a diet. Let's see how we can help her. So they've been, yeah, they've been incredible. Um, yeah, I'm blessed. I'm blessed with a, a wonderful family. It's been very supportive. Nice. It's nice. That's, yeah, because this is a significant journey for you. And I'm interested to hear, like, as far as the book going out into the world, are you hearing people responding to you about what's in this book and maybe how this book has motivated them? Any stories that have come back to you? Because if if you hear that back, then it's kind of like you're not by yourself in your story. You There's other people who relate to you. Have you heard anything back from your readers? 
I've heard a lot. I've heard a lot back from my readers, which is, as nice. you say, um, for me being a first time author, oh, when I, I remember when I hit that publish button on Amazon, I was like, oh, what did I do? <laughs> I think, <laughs> I, I was like, I had, um, what do you call it? Um, um, vulnerability hangover. <laughs> mm. It's like, you know, what, what? <laughs> What did I, you know, cause this book is intensely personal. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's like a mm-hmm. piece of me that I've put out there. And now it's open to everybody to judge almost, but the support has been amazing. When I got those first few store reviews on Amazon, oh my goodness, that means a lot. By the way, if you're a reader of books, do review. It means so much. <laughs> Yes. Means a lot to the means a lot to the authors to see those the star ratings and the reviews. Um, yeah, you know, just today I had a woman that um messaged me. I first had to say because she because she what's she WhatsApp me and I um I was like okay first who is this because <laughs> I don't have everybody's number on my phone. But when I send out my books and when I do the um the signed copies then my number goes with the um with the signed copy. So this woman messaged me and she was like no she um she read my book over December and she just wants to say mm. that she always had she's come to the realization that she's always seen dieting as a punishment, you know, something that she needs to go through um, because now she's fat, you know, so she needs to punish her body in order to go for it. And she's since come to realize that she needs to view food differently. Um, mm-hmm. She, well, she, 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 she listed three things. She needs to view food, dieting, and um the reasons why she eats, she needs to view that in a different light and start thinking, because the, the, the epigraph in my book, I say, um, let me read it before I quote myself incorrectly. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a, in order to lose weight and maintain it, you have to truly believe that you are worth it. Eating well and exercising are both acts of self-love. Um, so yeah, so it's, when I hear messages from people that that talk about the honesty of the book and the the way that I've not left everything out, how I just you know I try to tell even the things that I know people don't want to hear. Um, so I I I try to not sugarcoat anything, and yeah. So people comment on that. And that just warms my heart so much. It makes me feel like this was worth it. It was worth publishing this book and putting myself out there and it, it, that it helps people. It's great. And so this is not the only book now, right? You have, you're working on other stuff. You're a busy person. So tell me, <laughs> writing, like I think I, I was telling you before we started recording, I watched a video of you speaking with your community online and you're just kind of speaking to them and talking. And um, you did talk about a very important letter that you had written um, earlier on in your life. Um, And yeah, and you did address it to your sister. And I was just wondering if you can kind of talk just briefly about that. But I think you were mentioning that that was kind of a, a beginning point for you in, in writing where it kind of unleashed something for you, kind of like turning the tap yes. on or, you know, like letting something go and opening up to being a writer. Is, is that, am I kind of summarizing that a little bit? Was that kind of the effect for you? Yes, definitely. You're talking about, now, there's a little bit of a backstory here first. My, I've got two sisters. Okay, I've got an older sister that's, okay. Almost 12 years older than I am. And then I had a younger sister who's 11, oh, 18 months younger than what I am. Okay. And my younger okay. sister, um, we were quite close. I mean, when we, when we grew up, we were, I mean, it was, it was similar in age, a year and a half apart. So we, we were quite close and she committed suicide at the end of 2018. And, um, 
that was more or less the time I started running as well. Just a few weeks after after her suicide, she um, I started running. I guess in a way for me to process what has happened, and um, mm-hmm. yeah. So so when one of the reasons why I decided that I'll give therapy a go is when she committed suicide, I was called. I didn't cry. I um, almost didn't accept it in a way. Um, there was a lot mm. of things that I needed to do, um, you know, f- <laughs> taking care of some of her personal things. And, you know, so there was a lot of work at that stage. I, I threw myself into that work and I sort of didn't grieve. And there, and when I, when I started the therapy journey, then, um, I said, okay, besides trying to figure out why I'm so obsessive about my weight, I also want to understand why I didn't grieve my sister's death. Mm. Okay. So that was one of the things. That was the first thing we delved into as in, in our therapy sessions. And then, um, that session, that first session was, was chaos. And we did never got to the point where, I mean, when the first question my therapist asked of me, of, can, you can, you can say assignment. He said I should go, go up to heaven, imagine myself going up to heaven and going to talk to my sister about everything that I wish to talk to her about, everything I wish I can say to her. You know, these blockages almost that's been causing me to not grieve. And then I asked him, well, what if I don't Mm. believe that she's gone to heaven? And then he was like, oh, okay. Mm. (laughs) So, yeah, then we, yeah. (laughs) But we we could never, I could just not get myself to do that assignment, to imagine myself Mm -hmm. going up to heaven and talking to her and fighting this thing out. And, um, And then he said, because I struggled with this, he said, okay, Write a letter to her, okay? Write her a letter mm. with everything you wish to tell. And that stage I, I didn't write, okay? I uh, wasn't interested in writing at all. So that was, I mean, that was the Tuesday before my birthday, and it was my my 39th birthday that um, that weekend. And then that evening, that evening of my birthday and that sa- that Saturday morning up to early in the morning, this, all the things that I started, what I wanted to say was started, started brewing, um, in me. And I got up mm-hmm. and I started writing on my computer, just, just like so raw, just everything that I wanted to say and wanted to get out and almost screaming at her. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. and that's how I started writing. <laughs> It's with this letter, and I included a letter. I included a letter in the book, and with slightly less swear words than I did. (laughs) I took some of the swear words out, but I I included a letter in the book, and um, yeah. And that was how my therapy journey started, is with this raw letter. And, And that just became like an avalanche. You know, from there mm. to just yeah. write without a filter, you know, write whatever I want to say as raw as possible, as honest as possible. And that became the, the modus operandi for the rest of the book that set the tone. Mm. Wow. See, you know, that's – so when somebody picks up your book and they they see that letter and to hear you talk about that, the connection now for, as a reader, I'm going to appreciate that portion of your book even more now, hearing the the passion and the anger and the frustration that you poured into your computer to write that part as a kind of unlocked writing for you. I think as a reader, we get a better appreciation for you and your and and what this book means for you. It's not just I had some free time and I wrote a book. It's this is part of my healing. It's part of my journey to conquer my weight, 
deal with some trauma in my life with, with your sister, go back to your childhood and fix some things. Like There's a lot going on here. And the power of a book, for for a book to help you to not just overcome, but thrive and become this new person or become the person you sh you always wanted to be, right? The power of a book is amazing. It's the power of writing is amazing. Even, even if I never decided mm -hmm. to publish it, just writing it yep. down already helped. Nice. And in deciding to publish it, I'm hoping to help others. That's, yo. Yeah. I've, somebody said the other day, even if you don't even have a kilogram to lose, even if your weight's perfect, um, this book is still something to read. Cause it, it's not about losing physical weight. It's about losing emotional weight. Mm. Okay, wait, say that again. Say that again. That was very important, what you just said. It, even yeah. if you don't need to lose any weight, say that again. Yeah, I think if, that was really yeah, good. Even, even if you don't have any weight that you need to lose, this book will still help. Because it's not about losing physical weight. It's about losing emotional weight. When, mm -hmm. um, when I needed to write, um, or pick a title for the book, I went back to one of my therapy sessions and, um, my therapist said, he, um, he said, if you could take, um, all the weight that you've lost, okay, and you, you, um, you, you consider the, emotional weight that you're carrying with you if you can take that emotional weight now okay and you're going to put it on a scale you'll realize that emotional weight weighs 80 kilogram okay and it's not the physical i've already lost the physical weight but it was the emotional weight that was still there and that i needed to lose and that's why i called mm. the book 80 kilos of shame um, because it's a reference to the emotional weight, the emotional weight that I carried with it with me. See, and there, right there, is that moment where the title makes sense, the story makes sense, and I think, like you said, even if you don't need to lose a single kilogram in your in your in your weight physically, your book can help somebody. And I think that's that's amazing that you you've you have this. I, I like to I like to look at a book as a platform, as a stage. When you go to see a concert or you go to hear a speaker, they come up on the stage and they speak on the stage, right? They stand behind a microphone like we're doing, and they speak to a crowd on a platform up up high. Your book is a platform on which you can now step onto and speak to people and use your book as a way to reach people and share your message. So to have you on my podcast, even though this is your first time on a podcast, to have you on my podcast <laughs> using your book to speak to people, you have a great story to share. And there's somebody listening today that definitely needs to to read this book. And that I'm, I'm thrilled that I have the opportunity to share with you and share your story because I know that you're going to help people with this book. And I know you already have. And that's exciting. That is. And that's a wonderful, for me, it's a wonderful privilege to be able to do that. It's when, when, because I've got a few people that stick that check in with me every week, you know, that she just say almost, almost like the, almost like what my, 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 my little weight loss group was for me. I try to be there mm -hmm. for other people as well. That just, that just quickly check in how much I've lost. Am I doing well? Am I doing, you know, is everything okay? Um, and just, just sharing that journeys, those journeys now is, um, yeah, it is an absolute privilege to to see how people 
And I said, when I saw, someone said the other day, to watch the light go on in someone someone's eyes after it's been off for so long, you know, that's mm. just just amazing. That's the most beautiful thing in the whole world to witness that glow and that light that comes on from people finally discovering their self worth, loving themselves, and realizing that they should eat to to heal their bodies, to nourish their bodies, to become healthy. And not it's not a case of, oh, you've been bad, you need to only eat lettuce, you know, um it's not a punishment. And yeah, you know, mm-hmm. it's an amazing privilege to be able to do that. So if you had – I'll give you the chance right now, actually. There's going to be people from your circle that check in on you, people that are in your community. And they, again, have followed along from – throughout your journey. They have been your support. They have been by your side. And they keep you accountable, which is great. What would you like to say to those people? Because they are probably going to hear this episode and hear you. This is your opportunity to speak to them directly. Pretend I'm not here. What would you like to say to the people that have been with you, helping you through this journey? I think I would like to say that um, miracles happen with ordinary people that cross your path and just be at the right time. And just become these amazing pillars of support, words of guidance. Um, you know, if I think of all the people, my therapist, for example, that's, um, you know, he's, he's crossed my path and has helped me so much to, you know, start believing in myself and losing this emotional weight and working through this and finally being able to live and just being so thankful, I still find it so amazing that he's never seen me. He never, he never saw me before he told me, listen, you've got an issue. You need to come. We need, we need to work this out. And, and then my, my husband has just been there. Yes, day in, day out. He's a consistent pillar of support for me. And then my coach, my running coach, who's just amazing, um, and who's helped me so much. This just, you know, you can achieve almost the resources to achieve whatever you want in life. You know, it's out there. Um, you've, these people are there willing to help you and take so much of their time and effort and spend it on you. It's, yeah, it's humbling. And I'm so thankful for these people in my life who's been, and my group leader and, and our coach at our, or our, our chairman mm-hmm. at our running club. Well, we call him our coach, but yo, and, oh, these people are amazing and they've made me who I am today. Kept on pushing and, oh, this, t- t- today again, I, I was talking to Graham. Graham is our chairman um, at our running club, and he, we were talking about a book launch because we're doing the launch for my new book. We're doing at the at, at a running club. Where have you ever heard about a book being launched at a running club? <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, so um, so he, he's he's talking to me about this launch, and I'm like, no, I don't know. You know, this very is very appropriate. This is too I like many it. people that you know for on a club run day. I think it's going to be too. And he's like, no, nonsense. It's going to be fine. You're going to cope. And, um, and I, and, and, and I, and he asked me, do you have a banner and things for your, for your display? And I was like, I don't have things like that. It's like, no, it's like, no, don't worry. We'll make a plan. We'll make you one. Ah, oh, where in the world? It's just the support of the people that want to, to, to see you, to want to see you succeed. Oh, it's humbling, and I'm so thankful <laughs> for my life. Your story is amazing, Marie, and I'm just I'm anticipating that somebody listening to our conversation is going to want to talk to you somehow, reach out to you, um, 
obviously buy the book. That's that's the big thing. We want people to buy the book and leave a review, like you mentioned. But how do people connect with you? How do people how do people reach out and and, and speak to you? Is there is there a way that they can do that? My son says I'm very old fashioned. Okay, <laughs> but I still like Facebook. <laughs> So yeah, Facebook is a great way, a great way to reach my yeah. Apparently, it's not cool to be on Facebook anymore, according to my teenage son. <laughs> so, so yeah, so um, but yeah, Facebook is a great way to reach out to me, and then Instagram as well. I'm trying, still trying the waters with Instagram, but okay. I'm getting there. Yeah, my son showed me how to make a reel the other day. That Good. reel is going okay. So <laughs> then. then so yeah, and then email is a, another great way. And then I've got my website, um, which is, I think, probably the easiest way because okay. all the other links are on there. Okay. And we'll make sure we put all that information in the show notes so people that are listening or on their phones or on their computer or wherever, they can connect with you and reach out to you. So I want to thank you. You did amazing for your very first podcast interview, by the way. So big Congratulations on that. You did so well. And I want to thank you for for sharing in openness and transparency, sharing your story with Living Next Chapter audience. And um, we have listeners around the world that are going to be inspired by your message. So like I said, your book is like a platform. And now from this platform, you can reach out and help many people. So Congratulations on on being an author and another book coming. So I hope that we can talk again in the future because your story means a lot and needs and people need to hear it. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Thank you for having me. It's been yeah, it's been wonderful. A great introduction to podcast. There you go. Awesome. So if you're listening and you're a podcast host and you want a great guest, she's right here. She'll come and help you, and she'll be a great guest for you. Thank you so much for being part of Living the Next Chapter. Let's stay in touch, okay? Promise? Promise. Okay. LivingTheNextChapter.com has everything you need to know about the podcast, about our guests, about everything going on here at the podcast. So LivingTheNextChapter.com, head over there. We'll catch you over there. You can actually leave us a voice message on the website we have a thing called speak pipe and you can click the button and record your message if you don't like it you can do it again and again and again until you're happy with it I think it records like 90 seconds so send us a message and we'd love to include your voice on the podcast let us know which episode you liked which author you liked who you'd like us to have on the podcast and we will reach out to that author and invite them on based on your recommendation, livingthenextchapter.com. I'd love to hear your voice. You've heard my voice many, many times. It's your turn. Go over to livingthenextchapter.com and leave me a voice message. I'd love to hear from you. Have a great day. Thanks. Dot com and leave me a voice message. I'd love to hear from you. Have a great day. Thanks. MindShift Power Podcast, the podcast for teenagers and those who work with them. There's a huge problem in America today. There's a very large disconnect between teenagers and the adults who work with them. I'm looking to bridge that gap with real, raw, honest conversation, not held back by the chains of political correctness. You cannot solve a problem you do not understand. Want to understand teenagers today? Listen to this podcast. This podcast is for teens in the U.S. and Canada. To learn more, go to FatimaBay.com slash podcast, or just look for MindShift Power Podcast on any listening platform. I look forward to you being a faithful listener.